So uh, welcome everybody uh, to today's uh, Tableau user group, the Toronto Tableau user group. Um, we are live and we are virtual yet again. Uh, no surprise really. And uh, I imagine even our next session uh, might be virtual uh, too. Uh, we have a uh, interesting and also an important session today that talks about accessibility of dashboards. Uh, you know, we all try to tell a story with data and I know we all spend a lot of time trying to make look thing, make things look like just right. And, uh, but um, have you ever taken into consideration that there might be some who struggle to view uh, what you've presented? And if you knew that was the case, you certainly would want to fix it, wouldn't you? Uh, I know I would. And uh, well, here's our opportunity to get some great advice and uh, hopefully some questions answered too along the way. Uh, we have a couple of speakers today uh, who will uh, guide us uh, so I encourage you to ask a lot of questions and participate in this event. Um, and I'll just uh, turn the slide down. So your Toronto team is uh, myself, Roland Schlichting, and we have Catherine, Candice, Ojo, and Michael, who are also part of the team. And um, it says here, and I happen to agree, uh, you know, what we really want to do is showcase, um, you know, some of the great work that's been done by people uh, with Tableau and within our community. And, uh, you know, everyone always has a place to be part of this network um, or any type of community. And uh, we like to uh, work with all of you. So uh, before I get to our speakers, um, I want to let you know that uh, we are gonna be having a polling uh, uh, station uh, a little bit later on um, in the uh, meeting and uh, and I think there might be some prizes to uh, to be awarded to those um, who participate so I do encourage you to participate today in, in the question and answer and in the polling and um, you know I think we'll uh, we'll get going now uh, we're five minutes early um, and maybe I was supposed to say a little bit more uh, but we're we're five minutes early it's <laughs> Uh, so it's uh, first up, we have Erica. Erica is a, is a senior IT accessibility analyst at TD who spends, you can get this, right? This is gonna be pretty cool. She spends her work day talking to people about all about accessibility. Uh, so that is pretty cool. Uh, when it comes to all things uh, WCAG or web content accessibility guidelines, she breaks it down uh, into some simple tips for colleagues to follow. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Erica. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say and your presentation and your presentation, the, the five simple tips uh, for accessibility. Now, uh, before you get started, I noticed that you, you've been at TD now for five years. I have, yeah. <laughs> so is that one simple tip per year that you've been there? <laughs> it does work out that way, yeah. <laughs> So uh, I can't wait to talk to you again in another five years and hear uh, five more tips. I'll blow your mind in 2026. <laughs> so why don't you uh, take it away, Erica? Cool, sounds good. All right, I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. And I'm glad we're a little ahead of schedule because um, I have a lot to say. <laughs> it's hard to, to break this down into 20 minutes or so. Oh, are, can you hear me? Am I sounding okay? I can hear you. Can everyone awesome. see the screen? Am I sharing the wrong screen? Oh my God, I'm sharing the wrong screen, aren't I? New share, I gotta share screen two. There we go. There we go. Oh, well, okay, oh, try this oh. again. <laughs> like I said, good thing we had the extra time. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So I do have my auto captions turned on through uh, PowerPoint, which is kind of a neat little tool that they have if you're curious about how to turn it on in your own PowerPoint um, instance, you can go to the slideshow tab and then there's a, a little button that says turn on subtitles. Um, trying to bake in some of this accessibility stuff, like things that traditionally might've been considered an accommodation for somebody who couldn't hear on a call, trying to just bake it in so that everybody can benefit because I know I really appreciate when captions are turned on, even though I can typically hear the speaker sometimes there's loud things happening in my house because my cats and husband make a lot of noise uh, or there's stuff happening out on the street and um, just nice to have that text-based alternative to the words being spoken as well. 
So Roland captured it. I am extremely passionate about accessibility. It's like one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, as mentioned, I'm a senior IT accessibility analyst on TD's assistive technologies team. And I kind of consider myself an accessibility superhero because <laughs> I just swoop in and save the day when things are maybe not going so right. Um, but I'm extremely proud to be on this team. We're a really small team of like eight people serving basically the whole bank. And we kind of have two functions. And sorry, I moved my picture into the wrong spot. So we actually, I like to brag that we change lives. And we do that kind of in two ways. We're giving our colleagues the tools that they need to do their jobs. And a really common one that I always talk about is giving somebody who's blind a piece of screen reading software called JAWS, which if you can't see the information on your screen, you can still potentially access that information via audio. So JAWS reads all the information out to someone on their screen, whether that's an email or a document or web page or dashboard. Um, so we're giving people those tools to do their jobs, but that's only like one part of the issue, right? It's one thing to give someone a tool, but if the space that they're in doesn't work with that tool, what are you supposed to to do with that right so we also make sure td systems work with those tools and that they're accessible and meeting those web content accessibility guidelines and that's where i spend most of my days helping to educate my colleagues about what accessibility really means and to try to break it down and not make it sound so scary because it is a little intimidating at first but as much as i brag that we change lives every day i want to empower everybody on this call because you actually have the opportunity to change lives too by making more accessible choices, you will empower your colleagues and other people, whoever you're working with, to um, be able to understand the content that you're trying to convey to them. All that really important information can only get so far if it's not accessible. So by making accessible choices, you literally will change lives. And very, very quick, not sure how familiar this group is with accessibility, but I'm gonna break it down kind of with two really simple examples. So the dictionary definition is the quality of being easy to obtain or use. So can you get somewhere? And when you get there, can you actually use it? And the example that I always love to use, and this kind of boggles people's minds internally, is this prototype of a stair climbing wheelchair from the 1960s. So it kind of looks, it's like plastic. It is a prototype. It's not a functional thing, I don't think. But it does have these big spokes on the ends of the wheels. So it looks like this person might be descending the staircase that they're on. And that's an example of giving somebody a tool to navigate an inaccessible space. So I think it really did come from the best of intentions. Somebody said, you know what, not everyone can use stairs. So let's try to give them the tool to use those stairs. And I feel like that's like solving the wrong problem, if that makes sense. Because not only is this wheelchair a single use item, because you're not going to stack people into one of these things, right? It's actually kind of turning the stairs into a single use item as well, because I don't think very many of us on this call would be would feel comfortable trying to move around this person if they're coming down the stairs and you're trying to go up at the same time. So maybe not quite the right direction for accessibility. Instead, we want to talk about creating ramps. So now I've got a picture of a ramp on my screen, We've got like seven people on it. One lady is using a wheelchair. She looks cool, super comfortable. Uh, we also have a bunch of able bodied looking people who are standing up and they're using the ramp. They seem to be walking, which is awesome because uh, some of those folks might have invisible disabilities like a pain related disability or a neurological disorder that could make it really tough for them to use stairs. And so rather than having to like ask if there's an elevator or try to find some other space, some other way to navigate that building, they can just use this awesome ramp that everybody's using really comfortably. So as mentioned earlier, I am on a technology team. So this is the built environment. Where I'm focused is the digital space, and it's the exact same principle. So we want to design products, services, and systems that everybody can use super comfortably, no matter what tools they use to do their work. And so the stair climbing wheelchair example in the digital space might be like writing a piece of code so that somebody is trying to access like an inaccessible piece of software can work around the accessibility barriers, or sometimes it's also presenting content in an alternate way. So there's a separate accessible version of the same content. That's almost kind of like a stair climbing wheelchair because we didn't think about our end users when we were building this content from the get go. So I want to make a pact with all of you on the call today. Let's kind of start trying to think about our end user. Let's stop creating specialized tools for people to use so that they can navigate hostile or inaccessible spaces. And instead, let's just build accessibility in from the get go. Let's focus on those gorgeous ramps that everybody can use no matter how they get around. So a couple of things before we jump into my five excellent tips. Um, the good news is that making accessible choices is probably a lot easier than you think. 
Um, if you're brand new to this space, you might be thinking, oh my God, I opened the web content accessibility guideline website and I have no idea what any of these things mean and I'm scared and I don't know what to do. Nah, it's not that hard, I promise you. Once you get into the habit of doing it, it's really not that bad. So the better news is that everything I'm gonna talk about today is extremely simplified, but it does align to those international standards for accessibility. So nothing is like proprietary to TD, even though I'm a huge TD fan wearing my TD green shirt today. Um, none of it's just from us. None of it is for any sort of specialized thing. It's not just about Tableau. These are tips that you can apply to all digital material you ever work on, emails, documents, newsletters, I don't know, web pages, anything you do, same stuff. And the very best news of all, is that once you start doing this stuff, you're gonna first of all notice it everywhere and you're gonna see when there's accessibility barriers, but you're gonna actually just start doing this by sort of force of habit because it's not that hard. And you'll find actually in some ways it might make your life a little bit easier because it kind of makes the choice for you, which is awesome. So I found this little picture of a cat saying it's party time. And for me, party time is accessibility time. So let's get right into it. <laughs> uh, my first tip is just host more accessible online meetings. We are living in a virtual world right now, my friends. There is no escaping it. I have had, I think, seven online meetings today. I am, I'm, I'm at the end of the day now. Um, but basically, there's a lot of great choices we can be making to make sure everybody can participate in those meetings a lot more comfortably. So the first thing you could do is just offer alternate ways to participate. If you can take questions by text or by email or by chat so that someone doesn't have to like awkwardly speak up on the call if they're not comfortable doing that, that's awesome. Um, any kind of way you can think of to include more ways to participate is always going to be very welcome by different members of the audience for lots of different reasons, disability related or not. Um, this also means adding where possible uh, captions to your presentation, like I did with the auto captions for PowerPoint. Um, hot tip, I'm pretty sure Zoom also has auto generated captions. And I know that um, Microsoft Teams does as well. So if your company uses Teams, you can totally turn on auto captions. It's sort of an individual thing, but changed my life. Now I feel like I can understand what some people are saying. <laughs> um, this is another tip. So I have four tips under this main tip. Uh, consider turning your webcam on. And this is a big caveat, okay? Not everybody feels comfortable. Not everybody is able to turn on their webcam. But if you're able to, and if you're comfortable to, it can help people who have a hard time hearing the content they can watch your face and your mouth as it moves while you speak. They can see your body language and your hand movements like I do all the time. And uh, it really can fill in some of the gaps that we're just losing from having all this virtual meetings right now that we don't get because we're not in person together. But that's only if you're comfortable. Don't let someone like, you know, you have to make the personal choice for yourself. If you can help it, please wear a headset. <laughs> uh, speakerphone can be really challenging for some people to listen to. I have a, a whole bunch of friends at TV who use hearing aids, and they say when someone is shouting into their webcam, like speaker, like uh, like their webcam microphone, it's really hard, and it doesn't come through their um, hearing aids all that well, especially if they dialed in on their phone because they can hook their phone up to their hearing aids. Really not a comfortable experience. Lots of background noise. Really tough to follow along. So if possible, and if you're going to be presenting, especially or speaking at any length on a call, if possible, please wear a headset. And finally, this is the easiest tip of all, in my opinion, just describe what you're showing on your screen. I have friends at TV who are blind or have low vision. So if someone says, as you can see on my screen, they're like, uh, no, I can't see what's on your screen. So you're going to have to do better than that. But it's not just for folks who can't see the content on their screen. I'm also hearing more and more frequently that people are going for walks while they're on calls like this, where they just wanna like dial in and hear things. They're not necessarily participating. Um, so they're kind of treating a call like a podcast. So again, as you can see, does nothing for that person. They don't know, they're not, they can't see anything. So describing what's on your screen, thinking about like the key points that you need someone to take away from your screen. I don't literally need to go through each single like little uh, decorative image you have being like, oh, I've got two green, uh, bubble speech bubbles on my screen and they're overlapping indicating two people talking to each other like we don't have to go to that level of detail but it is just saying like what are the key points that you need to make and what does someone need to know about the content that you're showing so that's my first tip post more accessible online meetings it's really not that hard my second tip is related to color and this one is a, a important one for everybody who's working in tableau uh, but we all love to use color to indicate information whether that's text or in a graph or anything like that, but we just wanna make sure we're picking the right ones. So a big thing that we have sometimes is that people like to jazz up their uh, text, which is fine. You can use color if you want to, just make sure you're picking good colors. And what that means is high contrast colors. 
So black and white, quite high contrast, very different from each other. The black stands out against the white background. Awesome. However, sometimes when we're jazzing things up, we try to make things look a little bit slicker. And often we go into the gray territory. And as we choose lighter and lighter grays, that light gray starts to fade into the white. I'm trying to illustrate that on my slide here. It says, when you choose a light color with a light background, such as light gray text on a white background, many people will find it hard to read in an email, document, presentation, web page, and so on. And as that text gets progressively lighter, you can probably see on your screen, it also gets harder to read. So there's a really simple solution for this. I'm obsessed with this. I use this tool like four times a day to check all the colors in people's emails. Um, it's a free tool called Color Contrast Analyzer from the Pacello Group. Pacello group. Um, basically, you can use it as an eyedropper tool to compare your background color with your foreground color, your foreground color being your text. You can enter your hex code or your RGB code. And essentially, you want to um, hit that color contrast ratio of 4.5 to 1. And if you can't remember that number, that's okay. All you really care about is that text double A, that very first result in that checker. As long as you pass that, you're good to go. Don't worry about any of the other stuff. So super simple tool. This also applies to um, non-text content, which is important for graphs and stuff. Um, the contrast ratio there is lower. I think it's three, three to one or 3.5 to one or something. I would still aim for that 4.5 to one just so more people can easily understand what you're trying to show them. Um, Oh, my slides are out of order. Give me, one, <laughs> give me one second here. I have to move this up and go back. You're gonna see. Okay, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> um, we're gonna move on to uh, color, or sorry, text sizes and font types. Um, this is a big one, a little bit more impactful if we're in the same space together, but I still am gonna do it with you all. Um, size nine, sometimes we've gone into those presentation spaces where we're, we're really interested in content, but the speaker pulls up this, this slide full of teeny tiny text, so, so small, and it's really hard to read. And if we were in person, I'd get the person sitting at the back of the room to try to read this tiny size nine text. It says, hey, you at the back of the room, can you read this? I'm about 50-50 most of the time. <laughs> you know, people can sometimes read it, but sometimes it is really hard, especially if you like forgot your glasses or something. But the best, my favorite, is when people take this a step further and then choose low contrast gray text on a white background. It's still tiny, tiny, tiny. So frankly, I have a pretty short attention span. So if I come into a room and a speaker pulls up a slide of size nine font and tries to tell me like, oh, here's the information we're talking about today. I don't, I can't pay attention to that. I can't read all that. I can't see it all. And um, it makes me feel like the speaker didn't really consider this, the experience of the audience potentially sitting at the very front or at the very back of the room. How are we supposed to read this information? But what can we use for font size, right? So 12 is awesome for emails and documents, good to go. But if you're gonna do presentations like this one, I say like go bigger if possible. Size 16 is typically our recommended smallest font size for PowerPoints, but I say just go as big as you can. Um, Basically, you just want to make sure that people can read it no matter where they're sitting. And again, doing a great job of describing what's on your screen um, for people who uh, can't necessarily see it no matter what size your font is. And then sometimes we get questions about like, well, what font should I be using? Um, Arial is awesome for most of the communications we use internally. Calibri is also great. That's the default in Microsoft Office. Verdana is also very readable. Basically, they're all sans serif fonts. They're all just super easy to read. The lines are nice and like pretty thick, even if they're not bold. Um, so those are the standards that we use internally. Again, okay, this one isn't necessarily aligned to a specific like web content accessibility guideline. This is just sort of best practice, but you can't go wrong, okay? These are just good choices. And the point of this slide and kind of the whole presentation today is you just don't wanna make your audience strain to see your message. You just wanna make it clear for everybody so that nobody is left out and nobody is not understanding what you're trying to tell them. And my bonus slide, which was supposed to be last slide, I wanted to give a couple more examples of poor color choices because I think it's one of those things, it's easy to sort of talk about at a high level, but I kind of want to demonstrate it for you too so that you can actually get the experience of what it's like when you don't understand what's going on because color is barrier. Here's a terrible example that I made this very ugly banner. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not real. I just made this for this presentation. It says very important news. It's like a gray background on like a hideous lime green font. Horrible, it's super low contrast because the colors sort of mush in together, but it also has like the added effect of like being this weird migraine inducing like combination. So I'm really sorry, this slide won't be up for very long, I promise. So just kind of watching those color combinations and definitely using that checker if you can on your text. Um, here's 
was a, uh, <laughs> I made this presentation in the olden days, but I was allowed to give high fives to people, but I wanted to show a graph of um, lovely number of high fives that I've awarded to friends at the office. And I wanted to indicate each month with a slice of this pie. However, I use these like standard colors from Microsoft and I can't tell them apart in the legend. So one month I gave out 20% of my entire like yearly quota of high fives, but I don't know what, year, what month that was because it's just indicated with color. So if you can't see those colors, or you can't tell those colors apart, you're not gonna know what this graph represents. You just have no idea what any of these months are. So not a great experience, right? The easy way to fix this would be to um, add labels to each of those pie slices or have a chart or a table underneath that explains like in January, I gave out 20%. In March, I gave out 7%. I guess I totally skipped February. Nobody got a high five for me in February that year. <laughs> um, another way of just using color to indicate information that not everybody can understand is in action item those like status charts that you see sometimes sometimes you want to use like red for stopped and like yellow for major issues and green for proceeding as normal but if you can't see those colors you don't know what the status of anything is so very very frustrating for folks who are colorblind or have color deficiencies or just plain old can't see their screens um, those boxes are basically blank for them again very easy fix indicate the information another way so yeah, totally use your red box for stopped, but just also throw an S in there so that it says like S for stopped. And then in your chart, you can add S every time there's a red box inside that red box with so a nice high contrast S. Um, and so now someone can easily listen to the information. They could see the information. Everybody's good to go equally. And the final example I wanna share is my comments in red. This is a plague <laughs> at some places. Uh, we love to add our comments, which is great. But if you can't see the color red or you can't see your screen, you don't know where the comments begin and end. So what I started doing was adding, no matter who I'm emailing, even if I'm emailing my mom, I do this. I put a square bracket, I put my initials EF colon, whatever my comment is, then it ends square bracket. Then I bold that whole thing and I put it in red. So there's no missing my comments, my friend, you know if I have something to say. So double redundancy is kind of the name of the game on most of these things. Just don't indicate information with color alone. Now. Tip four, okay. So we've, color, we've covered uh, online meetings, we've covered color, and we have covered text size and font types. And now I wanna talk about pictures. So imagine I start talking about this graph I'm showing on my screen and I say, as you can see, our profits are up for this quarter. We're doing much better than two years ago. I'll let you look at the chart for a second. Erica, there's no chart there, it's a black box. I know, I did a really bad job describing it. But this is the same exact example that I use for when somebody sends an image without a description or alt text to someone who is blind. And this happens all the time. So a picture without alternative text or without a description is never worth a thousand words if you can't perceive it. And this is true for emails, documents, web pages, like I said earlier, um, this applies everywhere. And typically very easy to add alt text. If you're a mouse user, usually you just click, you right click on the image once you insert it into wherever you're putting it, your email or wherever. And there's an option to either format picture and add the alt text or just add the alt text. And alt text is essentially like a two sentence at most description of what's going on in the picture. Basically here I might say, um, I don't know, uh, a chart depicting our profits since 2015. They're at their highest since 2018. And then underneath, because that's still not quite enough information. That's not giving me the same level of detail that I'd have if I could actually see that chart. I might include the actual like table of information underneath it to give additional context. I might describe it in the actual body of the email or the document or the web page to give more information about what's going on there because I wanna make sure that I can visually see this. If I send it to my friend who can't, I need to make sure she gets the same information out of it so that we can have informed conversations about it and she's not left in the dark and I don't have to explain it to her uh, verbally, right? She can access the information on her own time and doesn't rely on me to tell her when she has to ask that question. So alt text is really, really, really important. If you're not sure what to say, you can always just talk it out with someone. I've had lots of brainstorming sessions on how to do an, an alt text on a, a complicated picture. Um, it's just always worth asking that question. And then my final fifth, and one of my favorite tips, because I made this mistake for so long, um, tell people where you're taking them, use contextual links. And again, if you are somebody who can't see your screen and you're using your uh, JAWS screen reader software, you can actually pull up a list of links in a web page or document or email um, to just quickly find the information you're looking for. But when you don't give context for where those links go and they all sound the same, like click here, click here, click here, you don't know what the heck's going on. What are those links? 
So your other option is to um, listen to the entire page or the entire email to try to get the context for like, where does this click here link go? Where does this one go? Or you could just go wild and just try to click on them. So let's see what these tips or what these uh, links actually look like. All right, learn more about the world's hairiest spiders. Discover the ancient ruins of angel fire. Okay, it's a bit of a, a wild list here. We're all over the place. Um, but maybe what I was really looking for was information about organic farms in Toronto. And that's the bottom item. Maybe along the way, I might have accidentally auto completed the adopt a puppy form. And now I've got a dog coming. Like, what the heck? So, obviously, an extreme example, but really important to give that context for where all those links go. And you'll see in the very last link, I will tell you, I did add PDF in brackets. And that is just to indicate that if you select this link, it will automatically download a PDF document to your computer. And you just do this kind of as a courtesy. Otherwise, people just expect it to take them to a web page. If you're hyperlinking two things, you typically just expect a web page. You might not necessarily expect an automatically download like ICS calendar invite, for example. So if you are linking to like a file type, just indicate that file type in the hyperlink itself. Honestly, people will thank you. Um, so you're on your way. Like I said, I could talk about accessibility all day, but I got to wrap here. Um, but if you think of accessibility like an iceberg, we have just scratched the very surface of that tippy top of that iceberg today. Um, <laughs> I like to kind of break it into those two things because there's really sort of two sections as I like to think about it for accessibility. The top part sticking above the water is the appearance side. And that really is the stuff that you need to know if you're working in emails and documents, PDFs, if you ever work in video, there's a bunch of multimedia stuff you need to know. But there's a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff lurking under the surface. That's the back end code that you'd never have to worry about if you don't work in code. But that's for stuff like websites, software, applications, etc. So there's a whole underbelly of the web content accessibility guidelines that you might never even know about. And that's okay. But I do have good news for you because I always like to share good news. Everything we talked about today applies to the whole iceberg. So no matter what you're working on, emails, videos, I don't know, your coding applications, it, you're still gonna have to follow the same color guidelines. You still have to follow um, like alternative text if you're sharing images, stuff like that. So hopefully if this is a brand new topic for you, this feels like a, a comfortable way to get started and a very quick recap of what we talked about making sure your meetings are accessible and giving people lots of ways to comfortably participate and like asking them what's comfortable for them. Choosing beautiful high contrast colors for text. You can use that free color contrast analyzer tool that I love so much. And just don't rely on color alone to convey information because not everybody can perceive it. Choosing nice, beautiful sans serif fonts that are easy to read. My best tip is 12 at least, size 12 for emails and documents, and then at least size 16 for presentations. It's just a more comfortable experience for a lot of people. Um, adding meaningful alternative text to images, trying your best to describe more complicated images and graphs, and avoiding using pictures of text because it can really pixelate when someone is magnified like eight plus times. It really gets hard to read. So just try to avoid pictures of text if you could help it. Um, if you're going to use links, just tell people where they go. No more click here. That was my big mistake for years and years and years before learning about accessibility. So um, don't use click here links if you can help it. Same with read more. Just tell people where the link goes. And finally, this is not where the journey ends. I know Kelly has a great presentation also about accessibility coming up. I have a couple more resources to share as well. Um, the web content accessibility guidelines themselves, I had to read them for an old job before coming to TD. I had to like literally sit down and read line by line. Made no sense to me at the time. Now it does make a lot more sense. But if you're a technically minded person, this might be a really great place to start. I love Microsoft's Enable YouTube channel. They have so many awesome videos that break down accessibility into very digestible chunks. Highly recommend checking that out. WebAIM is my go-to resource. If I don't understand something or I need a code snippet, they always have what I need. I love WebAIM, it stands for accessibility in mind. That's very cute. And finally, I love DQ as well. Um, they're an accessibility company, so they actually can provide training and remediation resources, and they also often host a lot of free webinars that are really, really helpful uh, if you're just getting started on your journey as well. So those are some resources if you want to get started, but I really do appreciate all your time listening to me. Again, could have gone on a lot longer, but I'll, <laughs> I'll stop there for questions. What, what a great presentation. Um, it's, um, it was definitely interesting for me. Uh, and I've already know a few things I've done wrong. Um, I'm kind of <laughs> forward now. I'm going to have to Google that adopt a peppy. Uh, uh, <laughs> that, that exists. Uh, I, I just better make sure it's not uh, available in my house. I'll have to block it. 
um, but I was really, um, I was really interested about uh, what you had to say about uh, colors and, uh, you know, a, a lot of what um, I do or a lot of what my team works on is uh, trying to tell a story with data and, and doing that we often use charts and uh, we use different backgrounds behind our charts. Are there certain colors like that, that you just know just don't contrast very well with each other like as a background? Like I noticed you had gray there at one point. Is there another color? It really depends on what you're putting together, right? Because, you know, yellow and white, terrible combination. Yellow is usually way too light to, to stand out against the white. And that's kind of a good way to think about it. However, yellow and black is a really common high contrast mode that a lot of people with low vision use all the time. So it's really thinking critically. And I promise you that like color contrast tool will change your life. <laughs> and it will really help you like discover good color combinations. Um, I do get asked sometimes, what are the accessible colors, Erica? And I'm like, well, I could make a list for you, but it would take the rest of my life and the rest of like my children and my children's children, like it would take forever because you'd have to compare every color to every color, but that tool will do it for you. So that's where I say to get started with it. <laughs> I, I think, uh, I think Kelly may have some ideas, uh, from a Tableau sense of point of what the, uh, the best colors are and which uh, palettes, uh, we should be using. And I'm, I'm sure she'll talk to that. Um, do you, um, do you also, another question, sorry, uh, I'm hogging the questions, but uh, <laughs> do you um, uh, foresee any types of charts that don't work, um, you know, versus ones that do that, that uh, people may prefer or not prefer, I guess, in relation to uh, being able to uh, access it properly? I'm pretty confident Kelly can answer this one with a lot more knowledge <laughs> than I can. I think it's partially, sometimes it's just about asking your end users what's more comfortable for them. And then thinking about like, is there another way to present that information? Because so for me, I don't, it's hard for me sometimes to see charts with lots of lines. If they're all kind of on top of each other and they're all going in different directions, I don't know what the heck's going on. But if you can give me like a table that explains the same information and I can look line by line, oh, okay, this is the, the journey or the story, I guess, for this, this first thing compared to the second thing. So having like an alternate way to access the information can help a lot more than just people who can't actually see the information. All right, well, one more for me, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but, um, this, is, this is very interesting to me. Is there a preferred number of colors in a slide that one can use before it, before it starts uh, to become blurry? So if I have a line chart, for example, um, can I have more than five lines or is it, you know, are there really not five lines that contrast well with any one or five colors that contrast well with any one color? So Great understand. question. I, yeah, the more colors you add in, the harder it's going to be to get them to contrast with each other plus your background. Kelly, again, probably has way more information about this. So I know Kelly, your presentation is going to be amazing and you'll address a lot of the Tableau specific stuff, but Roland, that is a great point that the more stuff you add in, the more competing like brightnesses, I guess, of colors are going to compete with each other. So it's going to be harder and harder. So we also recommend using things like patterns, like maybe one line is a solid line, one line has like dashes, things like that. So there's different ways to indicate them without just resorting to using different, like here's my pink line, here's my blue line, here's my, I don't know, brown line, right? So different ways to indicate the information, not just color. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll open it up. Uh, if people have questions, they can add it into the, uh, the Q and A. Um, and I don't know if any have actually gone through there because I've been busy taking notes. Um, <laughs> Candace, did you actually happen to see any uh, questions come through or do you have any questions or uh, Ojo, maybe some questions? I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, or the Q and A, sorry. So, so just for just a reminder to everybody that um, if you can post the questions in the Q and A, um, just to make sure that we see them. Um, but I don't see any. Uh, but James Maltman did have a comment that it was a great, fantastic presentation. So, oh, thank in case you. you didn't see that, Erica. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> but. But I guess uh, what everybody doesn't know, maybe Roland, is that Erica has to run. So um, if anybody has a question, if they could we'll maybe give you a minute or two uh, to enter a question. And if not, um, Erica, I think you're going to put your email in the chat if anybody wanted to follow up with you. Yeah, can do for sure. I'll do that after yeah. I stop sharing. Awesome. Okay, we'll but it was a great presentation. I enjoyed it. Yeah.
That Thank was you. a very, uh, <laughs> like, like you said, really uh, simple way to break down, um, you, you know, what, uh, it, you know, and a lot of the stuff, when you say it, a lot of the stuff seems like common sense, but um, yeah, but it's, it's good to uh, lay it all out there. And uh, because I guess you, if you ask somebody who, you know, you know, needs help understanding, you, you know, can't understand the things the way. Yeah, like even even abled people, I think would have sometimes have difficulty understanding uh, things. So I, it does really help to keep all these things in mind, so that um, you're making sure that you're not losing your audience, right? Definitely, you got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think you're off the hook, Erica. I don't <laughs> see anything else is coming through, uh, but you uh, did promise to leave your email in in the chat session. Uh, so that would be great if, if you could do that. And uh, we really appreciate your time and thank you for, uh, for sharing all this with you. You're obviously, obviously very passionate about this and it was uh, greatly appreciated your time today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen uh, if I'm not already. Um, I assume that uh, Everyone can now see uh, my screen starting now. So yep, I, it's up. Great, yep. thank you so much. Um, so uh, that was a great little presentation. Uh, I really appreciate your time again, Erica. So next up, next up we have Kelly. Uh, so Kelly, Senior uh, Director of Product Management at Tableau. And you might actually recognize Kelly's name from multiple posts um, in the Tableau community talking about accessibility uh, or more recently a post a few days ago on the uh, on what on what they say WCAG um, and you know what I 2.1 and I wrote it down web content accessibility guidelines uh, and the success criteria uh, for reflow um, and talking about um, how relevant that is when making Tableau dashboards I think that's a uh, article uh, haven't gone through it uh, has some nice guidance uh, and instructions for meeting that criteria and I'm sure Kelly uh, you'll talk about that criteria um, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to that uh, I know you've been with Tableau since uh, 2014 uh, with various uh, roles in the uh, in the product development organization I'm sure it's been um, it's been a whirlwind for the last several years uh, with Tableau it's like every quarter there is another uh, there's another release and, and, and new um, and new pieces of, uh, of information that we could use and, and tools and charts. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today, Kelly. Really looking forward to hearing what you have to say and, and show us about um, you know, applying accessibility guidelines in Tableau. So uh, take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Um, I am going to share my screen now. And hopefully this will work correctly. All right, how is that? Can you see that okay? I can. Awesome. Okay, so I'm Kelly Gupton. I am a product management senior director at Tableau in our product development team. And I work on a number of different things, but one of the things that I work on probably most of my time is accessibility and helping teach people about how to achieve the best possible results Given, uh, given the capabilities of the product we have today, when you're trying to make a Tableau dashboard as accessible as possible. And, um, and then also, of course, helping guide and, and direct and hopefully cajole our leadership into doing more for accessibility. And so I want to talk about some of that today, in particular, how to take these web content accessibility guidelines that Erica talked about and how to apply them in the context of Tableau. And so that was an awesome presentation from Erica, I thought, you know, though as a Tableau person, I do feel the need to, you know, we need to have a conversation about that pie chart. Um, and so uh, <laughs> it had some issues <laughs> beyond just color. Anyway, that's a data visualization joke. Hopefully the audience gets it. So I want to go ahead and get started. And I want to talk a little bit more about these guidelines and kind of what, what they actually are. So... Um, so the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, as it's said, um, it's an accessibility standard created by a group called the World Wide Web Consortium. 
Uh, World Wide Web Consortium, they maintain the standards for things like HTML, CSS, and those sorts of things. And there are a set of, basically a set of recommendations and technical specifications for making web content, so basically anything you access in a web browser, more accessible. Um, they're broken down into several different principles of accessibility, which I'm going to get to in the next slide, um, but they provide different levels of guidelines. So there's A guidelines, double A guidelines, and triple A guidelines. So all of the A guidelines are kind of like the baseline. This is what you need if you want your web experience to be at all accessible. And then the requirements get more stringent as you go through. Um, and so if you want to be aligned, for example, to double A standards, you need to meet all of the A guidelines and all of the double A guidelines. And this is how a lot of laws are written. So a lot of the laws require um, that content meets, you know, the double A guidelines. That's actually the most common. So the current version of the WCAG is version 2.1. Um, it was released in 2018 and it amended the previous version and added a number of guidelines that are actually quite relevant to Tableau dashboards because there's some requirements about color contrast for, for non-text objects. So things like marks on a data viz, uh, responsive interfaces and so forth. Um, right now at Salesforce and Tableau, we currently audit and report against the WCAG 2.0 A and AA guidelines. But starting this year, we're going to start auditing and reporting against all of the 2.1 guidelines. And that's actually going to begin with the 2021.1 release, which is going to be out really, really soon, uh, like in the next week or so, hopefully Friday. Um, I hope everybody's excited about that one. There's some really cool new stuff coming. So I talked about the principles and, and basically the way the WCAG is organized is that it's organized in four principles and there are a number of guidelines for each. And it can really help orient us as to what do we need to think about when we think about accessibility kind of systematically. So the first principle is perceivable. And really it asks the question is, can people perceive the website, the software, the information that's there in a way that they can perceive. So for example, if someone is blind, is there, are there textual alternatives to anything that's not text on the web page that assistive technology like a screen reader could read to them? So that's one example of how you can make something perceivable. Or are you using, like Erica talked about, Erica talked about, are you using colors properly? so that people with various sorts of color vision deficiency um, are still able to perceive information. So that's kind of what perceivable is all about. Um, you know, you'll notice that I also have my closed captioning on. Uh, Erica showed me how to do this in, in PowerPoint, which is really cool. I'm going to do it from now on. This is an example of making something perceivable. So now someone who may have you know, some sort of deafness or hearing loss is still able to perceive what I'm saying because of the closed captioning. So the second principle is operable. You know, can people operate the software? And there are a number of different things this includes, but the most important is asking the question of whether anything that you can do can be done using only the keyboard. And there's really a couple of reasons for this. So one, there are a lot of people who have difficulty using a mouse. So a number of different kind of issues with motor control, tremors, arthritis, and those sorts of things can make it difficult for people to use a mouse, but they could be more successful with the keyboard. Um, second is some people aren't able to use a mouse because they have limited motion and there are other devices that can attach to computers that allow them to operate the keyboard. Probably the type that people have, may have seen most often is something that's called a sip and puff switch. And so that would be something that someone who is unable to move their hands would use. It's a, a, like a straw that goes into their mouth. And you might have seen someone use them to control a wheelchair, for example. They can also be used to control the keyboard interface of a computer. And so basically, if your software works with a keyboard, then someone could use one of those switches to actually operate the software, uh, like someone who you know, could use the, the physical keyboard on, on your laptop or whatever. So that's another example. And then finally, 
Um, for someone who's a blind user and uses a screen reader, they're also not using the mouse because it requires you know, pointing visually at objects on the screen. So making sure that everything is available to the keyboard is a, is a really core principle of whether something is, is operable. The third principle is understandable. And it basically is, you know, can people understand the software and how to use it? Does it operate logically? Are there sufficient instructions? So this benefits all sorts of people, as well as people with various cognitive limitations or people with various attentional type uh, differences. And so that's kind of what the general idea of understandable is. And the last one, the last principle is called robust. And this is where you really get into the technical standards. So a lot of the ways that assistive technologies work is that they work based off of the code of the web page, and they need the code to be structured correctly, implemented correctly, well formed, and so forth. And as anybody who's done web programming knows, you can be kind of sloppy with your code and still basically have it work, um, unlike you know some other programming languages. And so what the robust principle the guidelines of the robust principle does is basically make sure that you're you're writing your code correctly you're organizing it correctly so that it works with external like what you would call user agents um, so that things like screen readers can understand the web page can say present different things like links and and headings and those sorts of things to a user who's using a screen reader so that's what the robust principle is all about so let's turn to, so kind of with all of that as a background, I've put together a top 10 best practices for dashboard accessibility with some bonus information for the new WCAG 2.1 guidelines. And I wanna go through these. And basically all of the things here are, basic, are based in the guidelines from the web content accessibility guidelines. And it's really like, what, what do those mean when translated into Tableau terms? So I've got them listed here, but I'm gonna go through each one of them individually. And we're gonna start with something that's really more of a philosophical statement, is that you need to design for accessibility from the very beginning. Accessibility is a design choice and it's a requirement, just like any other design choice or requirement that you might have. Like, you know, what data are you presenting? What story are you trying to tell? Maybe your corporate color scheme, anything like that, that's a requirement for what you're creating in Tableau. If accessibility is something you're going for, and I believe accessibility should be something you're going for, then you need to think about that upfront when you're designing what you're producing in Tableau. And the reason is that you can't really just make any arbitrary dashboard or user interface or whatever accessible easily. So if you, if you do it after the fact, you may find out that you need to make significant changes to your dashboard in order to make it accessible. But if you think about these things up front, it makes the development and, and um, thinking through these problems much easier to do. And you know, we know that firsthand at Tableau because of, you know, when we designed our software, we didn't design it to be accessible. We did not implement it to be accessible. And we're having to go back and do a whole lot of work to make it more accessible. And it would have been way easier to do that up front than it is to go back and retrofit accessibility onto existing software. And that's true, just as true for dashboards as it is for anything else. So the second thing is make sure that you're using things in your dashboard that we have worked on to make as accessible as possible. So, you know, I just said that we didn't originally design or implement our software to be accessible. And we've been on a journey to further expand everything that works accessibly in Tableau. And so really what I mean when I say this is things that are meant to work correctly with the keyboard and with assistive technology. Because generally speaking, only we can make these things work correctly with assistive technology and with the keyboard. It's not something that a user can surmount if we haven't done the work. And so this is a current list of the things that we've worked on. Um, basically what we've tried to do is 
pick the most common elements that are used in Tableau dashboards and kind of work on the accessibility for them in that order. So these are things like workbook tabs and dashboard titles, views themselves, and I'll, I'll talk more about what views, how, how we deal with that. Um, several different filter types, a bunch of the different objects that go on dashboards, parameter controls, and so on. And there's a list of these available on our community forums on the accessibility FAQ, which I'll reference later and tell you about. Uh, and I keep it updated so people know what all we've worked on in the product to make accessible. So I do want to talk a bit about the subject of views. So this is the, the visualization. So, you know, a dashboard is a collection of views. So um, what we've, we've worked on there, this is, this is a tricky topic uh, because it's frankly difficult to make a data visualization accept, accessible. It can take a lot of work and thought. Um, and, you know, Tableau dashboards inside of a web browser are kind of very, there's a lot of special sauce in there that makes these rich interactive experiences inside of a web browser that looks and feels the same as what's in the desktop product. Um, that's great, but it actually makes it really hard for assistive technology to work with that. So we literally are, you know, if you're a web programmer at all, visualizations in a Tableau dashboard are HTML canvas elements, and we send drawing commands down and basically, you know, programmatically draw a picture in the browser. And so that doesn't really play all that well with assistive technology. And so right now what we have is the ability for a user to open the, the view data window for a visualization, which then will present the data underlying that visualization in an HTML table that can be consumed with a screen reader or other assistive technology. And so that's what we have right now, but we're working on making it so that people can actually use the keyboard and assistive technology to get into the visualization, read headers and axes, the values of marks and all of those sorts of things inside of the visualization and that'll be coming out over time. Okay, so go, go to the third one. So the third one is, and this is a going to surprise people, um, is make sure that you've allowed data download for your dashboards. The reason why this is important is that the data download permission controls whether a user can open the view data window for the visualizations in that dashboard. And the view data page is the mechanism for providing an accessible table of the data that underlies a visualization. And the reason these things are tied together is that when you open the view data window, it's just an HTML table and you can actually literally just copy and paste the data out of the view data window into another object or into another file. So you've basically put in a workaround to downloading the data. So you kind of need to be, um, at least at this point, kind of okay with the data being downloaded. Luckily, if you're using Tableau Server or Tableau Online, you can control independently whether or not the view data page shows the summary data or the full data. Usually the summary data is what you want to make available because that's the data that's actually in the view itself. Um, the full data is really all of the data for the records um, from the data source. So that's a, that's a key thing to do here. And so I see this a lot on Tableau Public where people don't allow the, and, and on Tableau Public, it's a very coarse setting. It's a, you know, allow the workbook and its data or whatever the language is to be uh, downloaded. And that's what controls the, the data download permission on Tableau Public. Okay, so next is, so now we're gonna get into more of the specific things you can do in the dashboard itself. So the first thing is of this, is make sure if there's a title on something, show that title and give it a good title. The reason that is, is that titles for the objects in it or items in a Tableau dashboard actually show up to assistive technology as HTML headings. And HTML headings are crucial for a screen reader user to navigate the web page. Usually they navigate a web page 
Um, and there are special keystrokes and interfaces for screen readers that allow them to jump around a web page using its heading structure. So if you've turned on the dashboard title, the dashboard title shows up as a level one heading. The titles for any visualizations or views, those show up as level two headings. And then the titles for any filters, parameters, sets, or legends show up as level three headings. So, you know, make sure you've shown the title and make sure that those titles are useful. So in this way, you've, you've made your dashboard more perceivable because someone with assistive technology can more navigate it. It's more operable because they can move around the dashboard using the commands for their screen reader and the dashboard becomes more understandable as well because everything is clearly labeled and clearly titled so you're not guessing what say a visualization is all about and so forth okay so next one it's kind of similar and it's to show captions that describe your views so if a caption for a view is visible on a dashboard, screen readers will read those. So the way that works is if someone is, has their screen reader enabled and they start tabbing, um, tab key will basically take them to all of the interactive elements of the dashboard. So things like filters, parameters, views, legends, et cetera. When the focus of the, when the key focus arrives at a view, what the screen reader will speak is it will first speak the title, then it'll say that it's a data visualization or an image, and depending on the screen reader, and then it'll read the caption. And so what you can do is you can use the caption to give kind of a good overview of the contents of this visualization. And captions can actually have some dynamic elements in them as well. So for variables that are in the view, you can actually put those in the caption and you so you can actually put, you know, metrics and things like that that are in the view in that caption text and they'll be read by the screen reader. So what I have on this slide um, is an example from one of my one of our test dashboards. It's a histogram of SAT scores at a hypothetical university. And so for this particular histogram chart. I have a title, it's called number of students by SAT score. It basically buckets the number of students by various SAT scores. And the caption reads, number of students by SAT score is a histogram showing number of students by SAT score. SAT score is on the X axis, number of students is on the Y axis. Blue squares represent female students, orange circles represent male students. The reference line displays the average SAT score. So it gives much more contextual information about what is in this view. You can think of it as kind of the alt text for the visualization that um, Erica talked about earlier. And then the screen reader will speak the keystroke combination to open the view data window. So then the user could open the view data window and then they could get all of the data values that they can then navigate and access via their screen reader. Okay, so next one is to set a logical key focus order. So when you're using the keyboard to navigate a web page, you want the key focus, you know, as you hit tab, you want it to go sequentially through the web page and not jump around randomly. Well, unfortunately, Tableau's behavior in this area is not great. And the key focus, the order is set by the order in which you have dropped the items in the dashboard. So that's not very helpful and it does not typically result in a focus order that is useful for the dashboard. And there's actually a workaround for this, but it does involve editing the underlying XML of the Tableau workbook. Uh, there's an article, there's a link here in the presentation, there's an article on the community forums that I wrote that shows you exactly how to edit the XML of the Tableau workbook in order to set the key focus order to be something more logical. Um, this is something that we're working on now. Uh, in the future, the key focus order will be kind of by default, top to bottom, left to right. Um, beyond that, we plan on adding a user interface into the dashboard authoring experience that allows the, the author to set whatever keyboard focus order that they want. So that's something that's under development now, but at the moment, um, a 
little bit of a nasty workbook XML hack is, uh, is required to deal with this. Okay, so next is to make sure you're using text colors with sufficient contrast. So Eric actually talked a lot about this already. Um, on the left, I have an example of the word accessibility written in a light gray on a white background. This does not pass the requirements and you can test this again using the, the great color contrast analyzer application. On the right, I have the word accessibility um, in a much darker gray, uh, which is it is actually the same gray that the default Tableau font uses, um, and it does meet the color contrast guidelines. So then we get into kind of the other color related thing that Erica talked about, which is don't use only color to convey information. So Tableau does have and has had for many years a, a quote colorblind color palette. Um, that's great, but it really is designed only for red green colorblindness. And there are actually several different kinds of colorblindness that are that are common. Um, red green is the most common, but it's not the only one. And so there are people with different kinds of what we would call a colored vision deficiency out there. And so you know, there were a lot of questions about, you know, what colors are good colors? Well, when you're trying to differentiate things, the WCAG would say, well, don't use only color. Use something other than, if you use color, also use something other than color, because then you've dealt with color vision, any type of color vision deficiency. So in this example, I have a, it's a line chart. It's from the same dashboard. It basically shows the percentage of students by SAT deciles broken up for our hypothetical university of the different colleges or divisions within the university. And so what I did here, and you know, I'll admit Tableau doesn't make it easy, um, but I used a dual axis chart to overlay shape marks on top of the lines so that you can have some other way to differentiate these lines. So, you know, instead of just the quote, the orange line, it's the orange, it's the line with the squares on it. And so that's one way you could do it for a line chart. Um, you really kind of have to, it's, it's hard to kind of give like hard, you know, you do this, do that and such, because Tableau is so flexible in terms of the kinds of visualizations you create. You really have to think through, you know, whether you're, you're like how on a, almost a visualization by visualization basis, what's the best way to handle this? Um, you might choose labels. Those can be super useful as well. Um, making sure that you're, say, showing headers under the bar chart, um, maybe instead of colors on the bar chart, labels can be very helpful and all of those sorts of things in order for meeting this particular guideline. Uh, so the next is um, there are a couple of objects that you can put in the dashboard that have the ability to put additional text that will show up to assistive technology. So for image objects, uh, there is an alt text field in the edit image object dialog. Um, so I'm showing a picture of the edit image object dialog here to the left. Uh, the very bottom of the dialog has a field called alt text, and you can type in kind of whatever text you want. And that text for someone who's using a screen reader, that text will be read as the description of the image for a screen reader user. So they can have an idea of what that image is. Um, and then if you're using any of the button objects, so like the navigation button or the export button, there's a tooltip text in its dialogue, and I'm showing the dialogue for that on the right side of the screen. Um, there's tooltip text for that. And that tooltip text will show up as the label for the button to assistive technology so that someone will know what that button does and you know basically what it does when the user activates the button. And then the last of my top 10 is to use text objects on the dashboard basically to give instructions and context. So text objects on the dashboard can be read with assistive technology. Um, and they're a very useful way to basically give an overview to the user of what's in the dashboard, what views are in the dashboard, you know, what filters might be there that they can operate, and so on and so forth. 
And what I'm showing here is a screenshot again of my my test dashboard and just it's kind of like an instruction a little instruction manual for the dashboard. And this really is useful for hitting several of those principles, you know, understandability, uh, you know, operability, perceivability and so forth, because it can really help guide someone for how to use that dashboard. And then last but not least, um, you know, there I mentioned a couple of new guidelines in the WCAG 2.1. Um, so the first is non text contrast. So this is a challenging one for sure. You know, I, 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 I think a lot about what really best practices should be to make these data visualizations more accessible. Um, and when you start just applying the WCAG guidelines, they really constrain what you can do in a data visualization. Um, so the WCAG 2.1 basically adds requirements around contrast for non-text elements. And this applies to things like marks on a data visualization. And so it can be really different, difficult to have a set of colors that are high contrast and can be differentiated from each other and also look decent together. There, that's a lot of constraints on the designs of color palettes. And the color palettes in Tableau are very intentionally designed not only to be attractive, but also to be for people with no color vision deficiencies, unfortunately, differentiatable from each other, like maximally differentiatable from each other. And so dealing with this non-text contrast thing, I think is challenging. However, um, one of Actually, uh, Catherine Tubalcides from TD Bank, one, the, one of the leaders of this user group, actually created a set of custom color palettes for different types of color blindness that also are high contrast. And so those are available on the community forums. There's a post that she um, wrote about that, and I've linked to it from our accessibility FAQ. And they're a pretty neat little set of color palettes. It's easier to make high contrast against the black background than it is against the white background. And she has versions in the, the set for both white backgrounds and black, black backgrounds. I think long term, what I would like to see um, in Tableau is for the author to be able to choose whatever colors they want, but for the end user to have control over how those colors are displayed. So the end user would have options to say, well, show this visualization in high contrast mode or you know, adapted for my particular type of color vision deficiency. I think that's really where we need to go rather than putting all of the burden on the author to design visualizations that, that meet all of these different requirements that can frankly somewhat often be in conflict with each other. Um, but that's a, a more of a kind of a, a researchy future type thing. And then the last is there's a new requirement for what's called reflow. And basically what that's designed for is to allow people to use browser zoom to magnify a web page and still have the web page layout correctly and only require scrolling in a single dimension. So when you as you zoom in, you want to make sure that the web page can relay itself out so that you only have to scroll in you know either vertically or horizontally and not both um, because two-dimensional scrolling can be difficult especially if you're using assistive technology for doing that and so um, roland mentioned this one uh, it's great i just published it the other day and it's basically showing how you can use you know layout containers and dashboard layouts for different devices to actually meet this criteria and i have some example an example dashboard uh, and show how the layout works and everything. Um, and I hope that's that's going to be useful. And so the last thing that I'll show is just you know where to go for more resources. Uh, like I said, there's an accessibility FAQ on the community forums that pulls together everything we have on this subject. So our accessibility conformance reports are there, links to all of our online help on the subject. I've written a number of tips and tricks uh, that show how to do things like the XML, that show how to do you know, reflow and all of those things. Um, and then there are some videos as well. I've presented on this topic at Tableau Conference several times. And so there's videos of that, as well as 
some videos on YouTube of what it's like to use a Tableau dashboard with a keyboard and a screen reader. So you can get a sense of what that's actually like. Um, and that's where I try to kind of keep, it's my own little playground that I created so that I can publish um, accessibility related things uh, up there as well. And so that's actually the end of my content. And so I'd love to take some questions. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that. Boy, um, there's a lot to uh, to learn there. And uh, there I was quite surprised um, with uh, with the one comment you made about, uh, you know, the, I guess it's the order that we uh, put our uh, our views into a dashboard. Yeah, uh, that was a little bit surprising for me. Um, I, I have a question and, and maybe you can help answer. Um, I'm thinking about heat maps and uh, we do a lot of and, uh, and how does that play out for someone uh, who might be colorblind? Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be hard. And you know, again, I think data visualization is a really big challenge for accessibility. You know, it kind of you know just to you know, I don't want I don't want to throw our our founders <laughs> under the bus, uh, but um, you know, it's kind of like some of the things you do. It's like they're great if you have perfect vision. But if you don't have perfect vision, the mode of data visualization is really tough. Um, and you know, I've seen some amazing data visualizations that use colors very, very subtly to communicate certain facts about data. And it's beautiful, but it also is really inaccessible. And there's kind of, it's, it's a struggle um, to figure out you know, how do you communicate that and, you know, and I would say, you know, I can, I, I think about the subject a lot and there's, you know, we, we allow the view data window, which gives, you know, a table of data. That's, that's not great. You know, I mean, the whole point of doing data visualizations is to have, you know, a, a higher level tool that allow you to understand the data rather than just seeing a giant table of data. Um, and, you know, the challenge is it uses the particular modality of, you know, perception of vision in order to do that. And, you know, are there other ways it can be done? And I would say this is like really a, a research area for how to deal with it. Um, there are, you know, a number of things that have been, been tried and, you know, there are sonification is something that I've seen done where your computer can play a tone as you move between marks on a visualization so you can hear things get higher or lower. Okay, that's one way to do it. Um, I read a, a research article the other day talking about using 3D printing to actually physically print a data visualization as an object that you could feel. Um, that's great, but that's also slow and Everybody going to have a 3D printer, um, you know, when they want to read their city's COVID dashboard? You know, no. Um, I've done a lot of, of looking into an area that I think is promising uh, called natural language generation. There are a number of companies out there working in this field, and basically they attempt to have a system that does a that automatically produces a plain language description of a visualization or a set of data. Um, it's you know. It, your mileage varies uh, how useful they can be, but I think that's a, a potentially promising research area and implementation area for, you know, a computer, because it's, it's one thing to have someone describe a static visualization, but automatically producing by a machine a plain language description of a of an interactive dynamic data visualization that tells a human being what's interesting about that data visualization, that does not exist. That technology does not exist. Um, you know, it certainly doesn't exist for, you can create systems that do it for a very narrow subset of, you know, a specific use case, but in terms of a general system, it doesn't exist. Um, so I don't have a great answer for you about heat maps. You know, even just choosing data visualization as a method of communication is challenging. Is challenging uh, in that way. Yeah, and, and and you made a good point earlier on in your conversation when when you mentioned that you know accessibility is a design choice. 
and um, you know, if if I have you know a series of of dashboards and charts, do you think it, it's best that I just create a new tab and have one tab for that that's been redesigned uh, and keep an old one type of thing, or like would you would you uh, create a dashboard with alternate views? Um, you know, generally, the idea of having you know redesigned things for accessibility is frowned upon. You know, it's kind of a separate but equal kind of thing. Um, and often what happens if, is people will, you know, they'll get stale, you know, they may be not be taken care of. You know, I was, I was actually having a conversation with a, a customer earlier today and I said, you know, just putting on my hat of practically solving problems, you know, not the hat of what do we need to do in our products to make this better, but, you know, what can you do as a Tableau customer and user? Um, you know, what I talked to him about was, you know, if, if I were, say, working for a, you know, government agency or something and was responsible for communicating using data, um, I would probably want to create some sort of, like, hybrid web page where there's visualizations and then there's HTML outside of the visualization that can contain the data in better well-formatted HTML tables with you know, good headers and such that the view data window doesn't really give them and kind of construct a web page that way. Um, and you can actually use the Tableau JavaScript API to, it requires web programming, but you can use the Tableau JavaScript API to get the data from the visualizations and populate HTML tables external to the dashboard. Um, I've seen some customers of ours at for the state of New York do that. I think it's, it works reasonably well. Um, they did that before we added any kind of accessible functionality to Tableau. That was kind of how they chose to work around it. And I still think there's some validity to that. You know, again, as a way to practically solve the problem. But you know, we we need to do better at providing more tools uh, for this. Awesome. Awesome. There's a couple of questions too, uh, there is. Roland, in the Q and A. I don't know if you saw. So one of them is, um, does page size matter when considering accessibility, like long running newsletters versus fit in a window? dashboard like which would we ah. prefer when we're creating a dashboard or web page yeah so so generally you want something um that scrolls in one dimension that's ki that's kind of the main you know it can be it can be super long as long as you can scroll in a single dimension you know something that requires scrolling in two dimensions generally you want to stay away from um but there's yeah there's nothing wrong with something being long and scrolling or wide just the long scrolling is more typical for people. Awesome. Yeah, I think you kind of uh, sort of touched on that and and in a, in another point. Um, so somebody's saying, can you add two row headers on a table um, in Tableau? I, I guess they're trying to make the text bigger, or like, is there any way to al two row headers alternate the? I mean, you can have that. You can have. The headers and like row headers and column headers in text tables, they can be nested, you know, based on the data structure. Okay, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure who asked the question, so <laughs> it was an anonymous one. So I, th I think that answers the question. So it, they, they might have multiple headers. I mean, it, but it, that depends on the data source and like the hierarchy of the data source. Yeah, I guess they're trying to make it bigger then, you know, or more prominent. So I guess maybe you can make the text bigger. Yeah, I would use the, the formatting capabilities um, for the text. Okay, I'm not sure I exactly represented the question, but if any, if the person, the anonymous person who posted that, if that didn't answer, maybe you can post something else in the chat to let us know if that's what you were trying to get at. So I guess we'll leave to see if there's any more questions in the Q and A. And I'm not seeing any yet, but maybe we'll just give it a couple more seconds. Uh, maybe yeah. some of way feverishly. Um, in the meantime, I guess we could, um, like, I, we're not going to do the polling because Ojo had to uh, leave, but um, we did draw four names for the, the gift certificate. So if these four people 
um, could, uh, um, I can put them in the chat. And if those four people want to forward, um, I'll put my email address first in the chat. And if these four people want to forward me, well, I spelled stuff wrong, sorry. Can't talk and type at the same time. <laughs> if these four people want to forward me your um, uh, address, uh, we can forward you a $25 gift certificate to the Tableau store. That's awesome. So apologies about uh, the no polling tonight, but uh, I guess you guys didn't have to work for your, <laughs> didn't have to do anything for your, <laughs> but uh, you still have a few minutes to ask Kelly any more questions you may have. And, um, you know, uh, I just want to take a moment and, and thank you, Kelly, for, uh, for taking the time to walk us through that. Uh, you know, I, I can imagine it, it, it must have been uh, quite a journey to, to learn all that. And, um, and it's, it's pretty exciting though, uh, to know that uh, we can uh, probably have a new way of how we start designing our dashboards. Oh, look, I just think I just saw Ojo come, at, come back. Yes. Sorry, I, uh, my clients wouldn't budge from my meeting. So they kept calling me when the tag was going on. Um. So there's an, one more question there, Roland, oh, in the corner. But I will, um, I will uh, jump on that one. All right. So um, the the question comes from uh, uh, is that uh, Michelle? Uh, do the same uh, guidelines apply to to all device formats? For example, looking at uh, dashboards via desktop, tablet, or phone. Uh, great question. Um, so yes, but there. So so yes, but all of our work for accessibility has been in the web-based platforms, not in the desktop product. You know, if you might know, we actually have two different code bases. We have a desktop code base and a web-based code base. Um, and so we consolidated all of our accessibility efforts on the web-based code base just to make as much progress. Um, we're actually kind of moving more and more of the desktop product actually having embedded web stuff in it. You may not have noticed, but a lot of the dialogues that are like new features are actually web pages. And so we're kind of working on a longer term unification type thing where we'll have a single code base, uh, which is good because it'll be faster for us to implement new capabilities instead of having to do it twice, which is what we do now. Um, and that'll start bringing more accessibility into the desktop product over time. Um, it, all this stuff applies to mobile as well. Mobile is a, is a, there's a lot of stuff you can't do very well on mobile in terms of using, there are some conflicts between the user affordances that we have for like opening the view data window. <laughs> Unfortunately, when you enable screen readers on mobile devices, you can't do it anymore. Like you if you turn your screen reader on, like on an iPhone, if you turn voiceover on, it kind of changes how the interactions work um, and what it's like to click on things and so forth and actually breaks some of the way our software works. So those don't work great right now. But technically, yes, all the same things apply, all these same guidelines. Interesting. There's a lot of complexity here. <laughs> and we don't have any more uh, questions at the moment. Um, so we've actually already drawn the names and they're, and they're in the chat, I, I see. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, I, I, I give uh, Ojo a chance here if you do want to run the poll. Uh, I, I see we have the poll open. Uh, so maybe we can, uh, we can do that uh, right now. Uh, how does that work? Uh, Ojo, do you want to take it away uh, leading that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so on my screen is the, uh, I have stuck the URL to the chat, um, to the Kahoot, into the chat. And if you were to go in here, this is the pin. I'm waiting for the players to join. I have a couple of questions out there. So once you join in, um, you could do that poll 
and then we can have some results show up. Essentially, we are in the chat. Uh, anyone has any problem, you can send something on the chat line and we can check it up real quick. So in the chat is the link uh, to the poll. And uh, you can see the game pin is on our screen as well. Okay, so people are joining in. That's nice. Right now, two person poll. So um, while people are jumping in, Roland, do you want to mention um, about the next meeting, the agendas that we have and the tentative date that we uh, are looking forward to? Actually, uh, that's a good point. Uh, and uh, I, I know it's, uh, it's, I think it's May 14th was the, the tentative date. And unfortunately, I don't have the agenda right in front of me, but uh, perhaps uh, maybe yourself or, or Candace uh, might recall. It's uh, May 19th. May 19th, okay. Yep. Sorry. And uh, we, so, so far we have uh, Kevin Flerlidge. Yes. Is going to be presenting, so that's pretty exciting. He's one of the Zen masters and he and his brother can, um, they have their blog and um, this is the second time or the third time over that uh, Kevin has been chosen for the Zen mastership. So it's amazing, we're looking forward to, we're open to um, um, other um, folks from the community within our data fam to present. Um, so this year is gonna be fun packed, action packed um, and and we're looking forward to having this on the May 19th, as Candy was mentioning. Uh, Roland, take it away. We have three participants. I can uh, get started with the uh, Kahoot and you could play along. Oh, can I play? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I didn't, uh, it's too late now. Oh, too bad, I've locked in. So um, what's the kind of content you would most appreciate um, in our next tug. Uh, is it Zen Masters presentations, local stars, new features? I would say this, this one. And click, 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 done, next. So yeah. we have um, Zen Masters, okay. Let's move on to the next question, which is what's the frequency you would like for our tugs to happen? Is it once every quarter, that's what we have, three months, two months, monthly, or maybe more aggressive. And you have an option to pull in, we got two answers already. And I think monthly is a great idea. So Candy, we might need to step up our engines a little bit. Uh, Roland and, uh, and the team, we'll have to chat about this. But if this is what the mandate is from the let's thank you everyone for playing along. Um, we want to keep this poll going to be more interactive. Uh, we also would like our sessions to be more interactive. I know in these um, new normals when we're doing it um, from the comfort of our homes, we're missing that component of meeting people, uh, talking before and after. So naturally we might have to take that effort of uh, just putting some time at the end where we can raise our, a toast to and have an open session and questions for collaboration where we can open all the lines up for some introductions to happen. Um, if you would like to speak, um, let the leadership know um, uh, and then we can definitely, but Roland back to you, um, I would let you take it over and I will share the results of the poll after this um, uh, tag is over. Oh, and, uh, and that's it. This, um, to, uh, we'll, we'll be closing right now, but we could stay on for a couple minutes. But we really appreciate everyone taking the time. We had a, a good audience today and we had uh, two great uh, presenters and uh, it's uh, really exciting uh, to be part of this team and uh, part of this community. And, uh, and it was a, a joy to host today. And uh, I'm looking forward to, um, to uh, definitely to uh, May 19th uh, because uh, the Flagler twins, I mean, uh, 
you get any one of them, uh, that's great. They're both Zen masters. Uh, they, I, do, I, follow, um, I follow them on Twitter. Uh, they have some great content out there. And uh, I, I think it's going to be a, another really good, uh, solid presentation uh, for sure. Uh, so thank you, everybody, uh, for joining today. Uh, we really appreciate your time. It's dinner time for uh, many of us. Uh, so, uh, so thank you all. Rowan, fantastic uh, for the for taking out the MC on this event. Candy for being uh, a great uh, leader, and uh, look forward to meeting everyone. The winners, please don't forget to drop us an email, uh, and we can send those vouchers over. Awesome, thank you so much, Candy. Do you have anything that I might have missed? No, nope. great. Great uh, job and the speakers. It was lovely to uh, talk about accessibility and uh, we'll see you all next time. All right, thank you everybody.